Looks like it's uh, start time here. So if I can have your attention, I'll go ahead and, and jump right in and uh, keep going where we left off. I, uh, <clears throat> I probably don't need to tell you, but I, I should probably recap. You probably remember Tuesday. Uh, the plan was just to do a little bit of time doing examples from chapter 23 and then moving on. Uh, it turned out I did a lot more than that and even did some Taylor series stuff that uh, uh, maybe was good to see, maybe a little too overwhelming so early on, but you're, you're, you're going to need to see that in these next couple of chapters here. So I'm glad I did that. I'm not regretting that, but I do. The conclusion of all that is we did not get very far into this chapter. So let me jump right in here, get as far as we can. I suppose the good news is there's really not a whole lot of uh, teaching to do in this chapter. There is a lot of showing you to do, though. There, the, what you're going to be doing is probably very different. It's calculus, yes, it's physics, but it's both of those are different than anything you've uh, come across uh, uh, before. So, if I can then continue where we left off, we left off with this idea of flux, electric flux. And the symbol we had was the capital C subscript E for electric flux. And so let me just kind of review or, or to step back to where we were. We were in this figure here. It's figure four in your book. And what I was trying to do before we even get to Gauss's law here is to give you this visual picture of what flux is. And in case you miss it, there is a reason I'm focusing so much on these pictures and the visual because that's what you need to do. If you miss this picture, if you miss the whole idea of flux and how the flux really is the number of electric field lines going through some surface, you can't really do these problems. These problems more than any of the other chapters we've done. I know I've said it many times, make sure you do half the problem with the physics and half of it with the math. And so you, you're kind of reading the math as you go along and, and you're not calculating things per se. You're looking at the meaning behind them and that is going to be more true this chapter perhaps than any other chapter we have done. So this visual picture I, I, I can't overemphasize. And so I'm going to spend the, the rest of the day visualizing it, visualizing it. In fact, it's this visual visualization that's going to lead to Gauss's law. You're going to, we're going to hopefully go through the same thought process that he did. All right, so back to this picture here. Here is this ellipsoid of revolution or this egg. Here is the electric field. The brown lines are the electric field. Uh, out in the middle of space somewhere we have this surface. And I want to emphasize, it's a mathematical surface. Somebody asked earlier, is this a conducting surface or is this an insulating surface? It's neither. It's not made out of material. It is, if you can, draw your hand, you know, make an ellipse, rotate it around. This is the surface right here, okay? It is a mathematical surface. And I want to make sure that's really clear. This is not a conductor or non-conductor. It's not charged or uncharged. That, that, that shouldn't even be a question. It is a mathematical surface. Fair enough? All right, so there is some surface, whether we draw a square or a cube, and we're going to just do this for a while. This happens to be, as I said, a, a, a surface. And obviously surfaces are a little bit easier to see than just, you know, saying, hey, here is some surface. But that's what I want you to visualize. So if there is an electric field here, and I make this kind of egg-shaped surface, what you see is you see some electric field lines penetrating into the egg and some leaving, right? And the visual picture here is the flux is these number of lines that are going through this surface. So I'm hoping you see in this picture, everything on this side looks something like they've got labeled here in number three, right? They have the electric field lines going into the surface. And what we tried to leave here is everywhere on this side of the egg, the flux would be positive, negative, or zero? Negative. Why? Because what we said is that the way you calculate the flux it is a combination of three factors. The first one is how strong is the field? Remember we said the electric field now is represented by the concentration. Okay, How many of these lines do you have tightly together? Of course, how big is that area? And then of course, what angle is it penetrating? Now, we'll make it really small so we like to say on a very small area, dA, so there's our calculus, 
we would get a very small amount of electric flux. And of course, hopefully you are seeing that if we think of this as a dot product, that is if we give a direction to our area, and we already have a direction to our electric field, but if we give a direction to our area, we can write this little equation for the flux as a dot product. And so this takes us back, obviously, to physics 121, where we, we had dot products. And that just saves us from having to write cosine. Uh, I, I like this, though. This does help me emphasize that it's the size of the field, the size of the area, and the angle that it's going in. And that's why you guys answered that first question I gave you, that the flux going into the egg on this side, yes, it is negative. It is negative because if you look closely at the direction of the electric field, which is going in, and the direction of the uh, area vector here, which is pointing out, isn't that greater than 90 degrees? And of course you know from your math class that cosine greater than 90 degrees is a negative number. So yes, all of you who said the flux going in is a negative number. Okay? And so that's nice to remember as we look at the picture. We see a bunch of lines going into a surface that represents negative flux. What about the other side of the egg, where it's coming out? What are we going to get here? Positive flux, exactly. And for the same argument, right? We can write the amount of flux in each little square that we have broken apart there as this dot product. And that dot product has a cosine in it. So it's the magnitude of these two, which are positive numbers, but then it would be cosine of an angle less than 90 degrees, which is obviously a positive number. So everything on the far right of the egg is positive. Everything on the far left of the egg is, is negative. So negative value, positive value. And this one was deliberately said because it's 90 degrees. What's cosine of 90 degrees? Zero. How much flux do you get here? Zero. And you can see that flux line, that electric field line is not going through the surface. It's kind of brushing it on the, on, the, on, on the side there. Which has nothing to do with this class, but did you see that video on YouTube? It's gone viral with that lady in Russia. <laughs> she, no, we don't have time to show you. I'll let you, uh, I'll look it up. She's riding a scooter on a busy highway. It falls asleep. Now that in itself was bizarre. How do you fall asleep? while riding a scooter. I, don't know, I must have been, you know, uh, in a physics class and been doing her homework all night and was tired. But nonetheless, it came to my mind because she falls asleep and a big rig truck's coming this way and just brushes the side of it, knocks her back into her lane, falls off, all the cars miss her and she gets up and walks away. <laughs> but anyways, <laughs> that's what that kind of reminded me of. It's just this amazing video and just brushes it, you know. And, and, and that's what that electric field is doing. It is not going into the surface. It is not coming out of the surface. It is brushing along there. And again, that's this visual picture I am trying to say. Negative. Nothing. Positives. Now, of course, I think you see the whole picture now. What if I wanted to calculate the total flux going through this surface, what would I need to do? And there's the symbols we will use, right? The total flux means that I've got to add up every single square and go all the way around this egg, right? And so that is our symbol. Uh, maybe I'll put a little box around it. Although we're going to go one step further here, but that is really kind of where I was hoping to get on Tuesday. To, to leave you with the formula, what is the flux? The flux is just that. It is those three factors. Electric field, area, and angle. You add it up over the whole surface and that's the number of lines. And I should say net because we've got negative going in and we've got positive coming out. And so in this case, what would be the whole answer if I did this integral? Zero, right? Why zero? Because everything going in is coming out? Wait, did you just catch that? You just did a hard integral, didn't you? 
took you less than two seconds to integrate that entire surface, didn't it? By looking at the picture. Don't forget that skill, okay? Because trust me, you're not gonna wanna sit here and do the integral on that egg. You're gonna wanna look at the picture and say, zero, done, end of story, right? That's the idea. Question. I probably could. I mean, there's a lot of, uh, yes, yes. I'll, I'll say yes to that. And then there's a lot of things I, I, I could do. Um, but in this case, even easier than looking at cross-sectional area, which, which we will need to do that at time. This one, I'm just going to look at the visual picture and say, look, what goes in comes out. Total, total zero. I won't even have to do, you know, maximum cross-sectional area. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yes, there will be times where that will be useful also. All right, so I'll say it again. You see this formula? You see the idea of flux? That's step one because that then begins to lead to Gauss's law. Okay? And maybe even before I get there, let, let me just go to the next picture. Your, your author says, okay, before we really get to Gauss's law, let's make sure you, you got an idea of what we mean here by flux. So he gives you a new shape. A one that's a little bit easier to calculate because it's flat on the ends and so we're just going to throw a cube in here. All right? So here's the problem. Here, here is what's going on. We've got a cube and a cube obviously has six sides to it, right? All right, so there's six different surfaces here. Now again, that blue coloring is a mathematical surface, okay? So don't ask me if it's a conductor or an insulator, if it's charged or not. That, that's not the point. It's just there is flat, 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 right? Six pieces. Got a cube in the middle of space. Now, is there an electric field nearby? Well, that's what this little picture is showing. Now, in this diagram, they don't show the field kind of as, as big and broad-based as, as the other one here, but that's what they mean by it. What they're saying is there is an electric field, and they're saying it's only pointing in the x direction, okay? And it, and it just has the same value all the way across. So all the way through this little coordinate system, there is an electric field, okay? And so we can ask a couple of questions here. I'll start with hopefully the simple one. What is the total flux through the whole cube? Zero. Why? Because what goes in comes out, right? A bunch of stuff going in would be a bunch of negatives. A bunch of stuff coming out would be a bunch of positives. If you were to ask me to do this integral to find the flux on the entire surface, I'm going to come up with zero. And so I say to you, don't actually spend the time doing the entire integral to come up with zero because it's going to come out to be zero from the picture. Fair enough? Although, for educational reasons, I will do the entire surface to come up with zero. So let's take some time <laughs> to go through what is hopefully obvious in less than two seconds and see if it comes out to be zero to hopefully give us a little more insight into our idea of, of this flux here. All right? So here's what I'm going to do. I am going to find the flux. So there's a flux on this surface. So there's my integral. Now let me throw another symbol that maybe you're not as familiar with, I'm going to put a little loop here. Yeah, and so it sounds like some of you have seen that before. When you put a little circle there, what we mean is it's a closed surface, all right? And now, this is a closed surface. Why would I say that? What do I mean by that? Yeah, it, it wraps around itself, right? If you could imagine yourself on the surface walking or a little ant on that surface walking, would it go from one to another to another? Would it ever get to an edge? I shouldn't say an edge, but it, an end? I mean, it's going to make 90 degrees, but it's never going to get to a cliff, right? It's never going to get to a stopping point. You, you can't walk to the edge and, you know, stop. You get to the edge and you make the turn and you, you keep going. It's all the way around. It's wrapped around itself. The last two surfaces I've been showing you have been closed surfaces. We're going to focus more on closed surfaces than we are on, you know, an open surface. But just a, a regular sheet of paper, you might say, is an open surface. You can walk to the edge. Unless you think about it having thickness, then you'd walk to the edge, turn, and go on the back side of the paper. And then you'd say it's a, it's a closed surface. But, but this is a closed surface. So if you ever see anything like this, this is what it is saying. It is a closed surface. And so I'm going to put that symbol here because I'm going to find the flux through the entire closed surface, the entire six pieces, the six faces of the cube. All right. And so the equation is E dot dA. So there's my equation, right? 
Now, I should point out, I'm not going to bother to write a surface down here. How would I know that this has to be an integral over a surface? Uh, not necessarily it's closed. But what's this saying? DA, right? All right, so notice that, that your author probably at the beginning he puts a little surface. I did too. I'll probably drop it now. It, it's pretty clear. I have, a, I have a, a DA, all right? I'm over some surface, right? And so I'm going to close that, that surface. All right, so, so here's what I have, all right? I'm going to do, again, this integral. And like I said, hopefully, after a lot of work, fortunately not too much work, I'm going to come up with zero. This is all said and done. All right. Now, when I say a closed surface, that means, of course, the whole six sides. So why don't I do the integral by breaking it apart into those six pieces? You'll see that the authors label them. Uh, he's trying to say this side over here near the negative x-axis. This is surface one. Um, he's got over here surface two. He's got up at the top three, at the bottom four. He doesn't label five and six for some reason. Uh, but maybe I'll do the front as five and the back as six. Fair enough? Well, okay, let's... let's I do agree that they will come out to be zero. Let's show that they come out to be zero. You know, so it, the part of the lesson here is to really emphasize to you that what I have is I have an integral over surface one plus an integral over surface two plus an integral over surface three plus an integral over surface four plus an integral of surface five, which isn't labeled there, and an integral over surface four. Fair enough? And if I got to do a closed surface, don't I have to do everything on that surface? And it's, it's got six sides to it, okay? And again, you'll hopefully see, this, this will be done very visually here as I, as, I, as I lay this out. All right, so the first integral is going to be an E dot DA on that first one, E dot DA on the second surface, E dot DA on the third surface, E dot DA on the fourth surface, E dot DA on the fifth, and finally, E dot DA on the sixth surface. All right, let's start with that first surface. All right, now on that first surface, you kind of notice something, I hope, about this, this back surface, if you can kind of visualize it and, and, and see it. First of all, what would I say about the electric field everywhere on surface number one? Now, now I, careful with my question. I didn't say what the flux is. Some of you are saying negative. I think you're saying the flux turns out to be a negative number, right? Because doesn't the flux go in on the first surface? So yeah, so this better come out to be a negative number. And, and good, I'm glad you see that visually because, you know, hopefully I would never even have to do as much math as I'm about to do for you during a test or during the homework because you would see it without going through the math. But that's my point. I want to go through the math. So what do you see here about the electric field? What was the first thing I said about the electric field? It's a constant value, the same all the way through, right? Now, I don't know what its value is, but the idea that it's constant as I add up this this surface, as I'm in this corner versus this corner, down in this corner versus this corner, or out in the center, what would I say about the electric field everywhere on that surface? It's the same constant. And what can you do a constant when it's inside an interval? <coughs> All right, so I can pull this out, right? So it would be okay if I pull the magnitude out in front, remembering that this is really E times dA times cosine of the angle between them. And so I'm going to pull that electric field out, right? It's going to be nice that it did not change its value over that face, right? Uh, how about the angle? What would you say about the angle? Okay, I would say it's constant, and by that I, even, I would give it value. And I know this table here is not a cube, but maybe I can use it to represent. Here's face one, right? Here is the electric field going this way. So which way is the electric field pointing? Well, I'd say this way, towards the library here, okay, right? Which way is DA pointing? 
This way. So what's the angle between those two? 180 degrees. And isn't it the same all the way on this surface? Do you see that in the picture? So can I go ahead and put cosine of 180 degrees here and pull it out in front of the integral? You good with that? See, this is the easiest calculational flux you can do. Let me just go to the next line. What is, of course, cosine of 180 degrees? Negative, right? Here's the electric field. What is this integral? Integral of dA, what is this going to give me? Yeah, isn't it going to give me the area? And if you look here in the picture, they're labeling the cube with length L, so wouldn't it just be L squared? So there it is. There is the flux on face number one. And as you pointed out, is it a negative number? Yeah. And so it's the electric field times the area times cosine of the angle. They're all constants across there. So that's why it's the easiest one you can, you can calculate. Notice it's a negative number. Well, let's keep going with this. Let's look at face number two. Now again, if I took this workbench as the cube, then I'm looking at this face over here. That's what this three-dimensional picture is trying to say here. So I'm going to come over to here and ask that same set of questions. What could you do with the electric field on face number two? Well, as the problem set up, isn't it a constant value all over face number two? So I can pull it out. And in fact, I don't even have to label it E number two because didn't we say it would be the same as the E on face number one? I mean, so the electric field didn't change. So not only is the electric field the same everywhere on phase number two, but it is actually the same value as it was on number one. So I will still call it E. I won't call it E number two. I can pull it out in front. Uh, I can pull out the cosine of the angle because remember, this is E times dA times cosine of the angle. I could ask you, what is the angle for this one? Yeah, zero. You, you see that? Again, come over here. The electric field, again, is still pointing that way towards the library. But now the surface pointing outward is also towards the library. The angle here is zero. So this is cosine of zero degrees. And then I've got an integral of dA again. And of course, this cosine of zero is just a positive one. So I got E. And the integral of the area, what does that give me? Yeah, that gives me the area of face number two, which, as you said, is L squared. So there is L squared. All right. Now, again, positive number or negative number here on face number two? Doesn't that come out to be a positive? And shouldn't it? Isn't the flux coming out? So, sure enough, flux coming out, positive number. Flux going in, negative number. Let's go to face number three. Face number three is at the top here. So it'll be like the top of this workbench. Okay, how much flux is going through the top? Zero, right? Do you see that visually? Which way is the flux going? Sideswiping it, right? It's going that way. It's going towards the library. Which way is the DA? Perpendicular up, right? Nothing goes through this face. If you see the visual picture. Mathematically, what's the angle? 90. What's cosine of 90? Zero. So again, what we have is this, well, I'll just put it here, cosine of 90 degrees. That just gives everything away right there, cosine of 90 degrees. It's always 90 degrees everywhere on this, 90 degrees. Cosine of 90, zero. Zero plus zero plus zero plus zero plus zero gives me a total of zero. So no flux goes through face number three. How about four? How about five? <laughs> How about six? All right, so do you see the same effect in, in uh, four, five, and six? Four, five, and six, the electric field is always, is always brushing it. Uh, four, they've got the bottom. Again, we're brushing it. Five would be this front one up here. Again, the electric field just kind of brushing along. Six, oh, back here, it's brushing along here. And so four, five, and six are a bunch of zeros, right? So when I put all this together, what's my total answer? Zero. Like I said, it was a long way of coming up with zero. And so hopefully the zero was obvious to you within two seconds, but at the same time, I think breaking it apart into its individual pieces is, is, was a 
good academic exercise to show you. This is how we would do the flux. This is what we mean by calculating the flux on a closed surface. Break it down into all of its pieces. Uh, look at the pitcher, perhaps. Look at the subparts of the pitcher. And, and see what's going on here in terms of, of calculating the flux. Right? And so that's, uh, like I said, what, uh, what uh, Gauss is leading up to. All right, so I'm, I'm getting the impression, and I'm hoping here, that you're, you're getting this idea of what is flux. Well, let me give you another picture. Or let me start to ask the same question that Gauss is saying. Take any closed surface. I'm going to take a, any closed surface you can think of. And let's look at the flux through any closed surface. I mean, so far we've been getting a lot of zeros. Will we always get zero? I mean, can you think of a scenario where you wouldn't get zero? I think nine. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it's eight I want. Look at that crazy shape. What's the flux through that one? See this crazy shape? And there's this charge over here, just, just outside of it to the, to the left. What's the flux from this one? Isn't it zero too? Right? Can, can you see this one? One, two, three, four, five go in. How many come out? Five, five in, five out, total? Zero? So again, so far everything I've shown you is zero. Do they, will they always come out to be zero? When will it not come out to be zero? Right. And so doesn't the charge on the inside play a key role here. And that's, flux, uh, that's uh, Gauss's argument. And what I want you to see, Gauss begins to look at this whole idea of flux and realizes that you're going to always get zero unless there's a charge inside. Right? And let's say it's a positive charge. Let me give you a picture. This one doesn't have, obviously, one inside. But the picture before this does. A uh, picture, I think it's seven here says, now let's put the charge inside the, the surface. Now, would this be a positive charge or a negative charge? It's positive. And would the flux be positive or negative? Positive. See how it got all these lines coming out? See, the only way you can ever get more lines coming out than going in is if you had a positive charge in there, right? The flux, the electric field lines start on there. And so this is Gauss's argument that if you look at the flux over some kind of closed surface, it's got to be related to the charge that is inside that surface. Well, what about the charges outside the surface? Yeah, they, I mean, they'll have flux, but won't they have an equal number that goes in and goes out? Okay. So the only thing that contributes to a net flux is charges that are on the inside. Now, I know you're still asking, how is that useful? <laughs> well, you'll be surprised how really useful this is. But I want you to see his, his thinking, his logic here. His logic is, look, you can get some positive fluxes. Now, it doesn't show in this picture, but what if this was a negative charge? What would change here? It would be opposite, right? The lines would be going in. And would you get positive flux or negative flux? Because yeah, they're going in, you get negative flux here. And again, again, that's why I'm putting this up as an equation. I'm not done with the equation yet, but Gauss's argument here is that this flux is somehow related to the charge inside. If you have positive charge inside, you get positive flux, positive net flux. If you have negative charge on the inside, you get negative flux. Okay? Now, of course, there's got to be some kind of proportionality constant here. You know, he's, got, he's saying the flux is related to the charge. Now, it's just related, so there's some kind of number. I don't know what number goes out there. It's probably not a one, certainly not a seven. Uh, maybe it is, maybe a lucky guess. Uh, chances are it's probably maybe a little more complicated. Hopefully not too complicated. I doubt if it's a square root of two over pi to the natural power of e to the seventh. I, you know, I, I doubt if it's something like that. 
But I bet we could figure it out. Let's look at this picture for a moment. And see if we're getting the idea of the, uh, of, of the flux. Now, obviously, this one comes out to be non-zero, right? And let me ask you this. Let's look at these different surfaces. You'll see the author has labeled surface one, two, and three. Uh, how would the flux, say, going through surface one compared to two? Is it the same flux? Well, I heard somebody say it's a bigger area. Oh, the angles are different. But see, it's the same flux. This is the beauty of the flux, right? Are the angles the same? No. Is the area the same? No. Is the electric field at surface one and two the same? No. What is the same? The number of electric field lines. The flux. That's what's constant in these surfaces. So if I can take you all the way back to physics 121, that's kind of the things we look for in science. What, what, those conservational-like principles. What's the same? The energy, conservation of energy. What's the same? The momentum, conservation of momentum. The angular momentum, right? And we did all of our mechanics with conservation of energy, conservation of momentum, conservation of angular momentum. And Newton's three laws. But we spent a whole semester doing those six steps. I mean, why would we possibly spend 15 weeks with three, six sentences, right? But that is a powerful tool. What hasn't changed? And you're going to see that here. This is a powerful tool. Surface one and surface two have the same flux. What about surface three? Same flux too, right? So if you're asked to find the flux through surface three, maybe you'd be better off over surface one, which is kind of what you were doing, right? You were doing that earlier. You were trying to solve the flux in that egg. And you said, well, wouldn't that be equivalent of? And you were saying something else. Exactly. And you can see that in this visual picture here. Uh, wouldn't surface one have a positive flux though? So there's no charges coming in. So surface one looks like this. Yeah. And it's supposed to be three-dimensional. I know it's kind of hard to see, but it, it, so it's a, surface one is supposed to be a perfect sphere. Well, and I'm going to use that one to do a calculation because surface two and three are going to be hard to do a calculation. So if I really wanted to know something about three, I would not calculate three. I would do one, realizing they're the same. So that's the point I want to get at. But I see in surface one, these lines are going out. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve are going out, right? And in surface two, I have the same twelve going out. Yeah, but you also I don't have any going in. Where's the end? Well, they're coming in from surface one, aren't they? Oh, I, oh, I, 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 I yeah, I, I think uh, I, this is not a hollowed out section. Surface two is around surface one. Is it, so it's, surface two is also includes surface one? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so surface, if, if this is the charge, surface one is like this. Okay. Now, forget surface one. Surface two is just a bigger blob, but it's not hollowed out in the middle. Okay. okay. I just thought yeah. like surface one might take yeah. some space in surface two. And then yeah, I, I, right. I see what you're saying. And I would agree then surface two would have zero flux if we hollowed it out in the sense that my, my volume then is an outside with a hollow cavity. Yeah. But that's not what they mean there. But good, good. You see it. Obviously, you see it then. So that's, that's good. All right? So let's do this. And so this is what Gauss is going to do. And this is going to lead us to Gauss's, Gauss's law. This is going to lead us to the really the final and the most important step and only step of this chapter, Gauss's law. Gauss's law is going to be a nice equation that relates flux to charge. We've got to find that number right there. Once we got that number, I've got flux to charge. And now... If you look at a picture, if I give you charge, you can give me flux. And from flux, I can get electric field. Remember when we started this chapter, I said Gauss's law is going to be a nice tool to find the electric field, something different than we did last chapter with Coulomb's law. And so think about that. First chapter, we learned Coulomb's law. That gave us tools to find the electric field. That's not the only way to find the electric field. This chapter is saying, let's give you another technique to find the electric field. And this will be a very powerful technique. It will make some problems that would be, have been extremely hard to do with Gauss's, I mean with Coulomb's law, trivially easy. Okay? 
And so, of course, one of the skills you want to learn is not only have you learned there are two ways so far <laughs> to get the electric field. We'll learn a third one next chapter. But you will look at those two ways and decide, okay, which approach do I want to have? Which is going to make this a little bit easier? And remember I said if there's a lot of symmetry involved, it's Gauss's law that you want to use. Okay? And so that's what we're about to see. So let's finish this by doing this. Let's actually do a, another calculation. Let's actually find this unknown. What is that constant? And once we have that, we have done the same logic that Gauss did. And we, come, we have come up with Gauss's law. And now we will use it again and again and again. And I will use the balance of the time to just do demonstrations to just show you how I am going to use Gauss's law to get the electric field. Or maybe the other way around sometimes. Use the electric field to get the charge. But it's usually how do I use Gauss's law to get the electric field. But, so let me drop one more picture. Let me get rid of those three surfaces and just focus on surface number one. Uh, surface number one looks something a little more like this. Okay? And I claim that you can calculate the flux from that. It's going to take a little cleverness. That's what I want you to see. But let's do this integral. Remember we did the cube? Now let's do a sphere. Okay? So I have a little point charge. There's Q. Okay? And so that's what this side of the equation, the right side of the equation is saying. How much charge is inside? Just Q, right? Now, let me do the flux on that blue surface. So I'm going to draw, or your author has drawn here, a surface. Now, again, this is a blue surface. It's surrounding the charge. Again, this is not going to ask whether this is a conductor or an insulator. It is just a mathematical surface some distance out. How far out? R. Okay? We often will call this a Gaussian surface. Okay? Now I could have made any closed surface, fair enough? So why choose the spherical one? What's going to be nice about this one? There's a lot of symmetry in here. For example, what would you say about the direction of the electric field and the area vector? Yeah. You look anywhere on this surface. Uh, the author has put it here and says right here, the electric field is pointing radially outward. That's what we learned from a point charge. What direction is the area vector? Radially outward. So what's the angle between these two vectors? Zero. What would it be if we did it down here? Zero, right? They'd be both going that way. What if we did it over here? Zero. Zero, right? Everywhere on this surface, the angle is at zero. So as I do this integral, and I do this first step, which is to take the dot product, I can at least say that the angle is the same, which I can pull out. I don't even have to do that much, because what's nice about cosine of zero? It's one. Now, would that be true if I had drawn a cube around that surface? No. So you see a good choice of surface has made this integral very easy. And that's the skill you want to get. The, what makes this integral possible and easy to do is the symmetries involved. You got to look at the picture to see the symmetry. My warning for you is make sure that the Gaussian surface, the mathematical surface that is in your head, has that same symmetry as the charges that are there. Or if not the charges, the electric field that is made by those charges because that's what's really relevant. What is the direction of the electric field and the area vector? Fair enough? And so that has made this possible by taking this first step. And I'll pull that out. Now, I'll keep going. What about the electric field? Don't we know the value of the electric field from a point? Isn't that what we learned in the last chapter? That's what we need to know in order to answer this question. What's this missing factor here? All right. So, what did we learn in the last chapter? The equation for the electric field at some distance r, there's my surface. What is the electric field at that point? All right. So, here's my integral. It's Coulomb's constant times the charge Q over r squared. Right? And so there's the value of 
the electric field. So there's what I have so far. And I'll do you one better. The reason, another reason for picking the sphere was not just that the angle was nice to look at. What would you say about the electric field everywhere on the sphere? It's a constant, right? Everywhere on that sphere, R is the same distance away from the charge. So, what could I pull out of the integral? <laughs> All of this, right? I can pull out Coulomb's constant, I can pull out the charge. Those are probably obvious, but I can also pull out R squared. Because as I integrate over this surface, I'm not changing R. Okay? R is a constant value everywhere over that surface. So again, that well-chosen Gaussian surface is really the key to success in these problems. You got to be able to see the angle and you got to see something about the electric field. Okay? Because now it's so pretty straightforward and like I said, we're, we're probably not going to do really the integral. It's more visual. Because look at this next step. What is the integral? What is this saying right here? Integrate over the surface, right? What's this going to give me? It's going to give me the area, right? All I'm doing is adding up a little areas. Little area plus little area plus little area, then I get the total area. And how do I calculate the total area, the surface area of a sphere? 4 pi r squared. Yay! Right? And so there's my integral. Okay? If you even want to call it an integral. I didn't really do it. Did you catch that? Did you catch how visual this was? Angle, electric field pulled out in front. This is the integral, but it just gives me area. I'm not even going to actually do an integral. I'm just going to go back to my geometry. The area of a sphere is 4 pi r squared. Okay? Now, they won't always be quite this simple, but they will be visual, and that's what you want to see here. In fact, let's see something else here. Notice the r squares cancel off. What does that mean to you? Yeah, that means if I would have drawn any Gaussian surface, a small radius or a big radius, I would get the same amount of flux, right? Fair enough. We, we, we said that already visually. You can make this a big surface or a small surface. And essentially what you're saying is if you make it a big surface, out here on the surface the electric field is small but the area is big. And in here, the surface is small but the field is big. And what doesn't change is that electric flux. And we see it here in the math now as we start to do this calculation. We're going to get that same amount of flux. Yeah. I, okay, and, and again, best I can do, this is visual, okay? So here's my point charge. Not exactly a point there, but, but there's my charge, right? Okay? Now, from this, I would have an electric field radially outward. This way. Over here, this way. Over here, this way. Here, be down. Out towards you. Back towards me, right? So I'm going to draw a surface around it. Okay? And it's a spherical surface. So on this part of the surface by me, the area is pointing outward this way. Well, and so is the electric field. So they're in the same direction, the zero degrees. If I go somewhere else over here, well, here's the surface. The DA is this way, but the electric field's this way. Up here at the top, you get the idea? Yeah. yeah. And so everywhere on this surface, the angle is zero degrees. Okay? Between the area and the electric field. I am not saying that the angle is always zero degrees like it's always pointing in the x-axis. Don't, don't mix that up. That's not what I am saying. Yeah. Right. I, over here it's on the x-axis. Over here it's pointing the negative x-axis. Over here it's in the positive y-axis. Over here it's in the positive z-axis. And so the direction of the electric field certainly does change. But it's always in the same direction as how the area one changed. In fact, I'm going to turn this, I think our, see if our air conditioner goes on, and if it does, we'll close the doors there now, all right? Okay, well, finally, we're getting, like I said, really to the end of the lecture. I finally get Gauss's Law, because I can finish this. There's a Q on both sides, and I finally get to the missing piece that uh, I want you to see, and a few more comments about it, but that would be the constant out in, in front. 
The constant out in front would be made up of three other constants. <laughs> Coulomb's constant, the number four, and the number pi. Like I said, I would have never guessed that. So I'm glad we went through the calculation here. And in fact, we'll do one more step. We will group all those together. This ratio, Coulomb's constant, the four and the pi, is nice to think of it as one constant. And it's nice to think of it as one over a constant. You'll see that as we continue on here. And so this, let me introduce it to you. This is what we are going to call the permittivity of free space. And so Gauss's law is written with this Greek letter epsilon. Uh, right here, what? Oh, inside. Okay, inside. And again, I want to, I'll just emphasize that as we do examples. Notice that I will only be caring about the charge on the inside. Even if I'm doing a problem that has charges on the outside. That's the key of how, why this thing can be so powerful. Even though you have charges on the outside. And even though, yes, they contribute to the overall net effect of the electric field, you don't have to worry about them in the calculation because the flux from those are zeros. And so that's why there are certain times where even though you've got this complicated mess of charges, you only worry about the one on the inside. And you make the problem a lot easier. Okay? So here's the grand finale here. We got this. We've got the integral over any closed surface that is the flux on any closed surface, would equal to the charge that is inside of that surface divided by epsilon naught, this permittivity of free space. And it's called free space and permittivity because as you're going to see, it is really kind of telling you how that electric field is, its strength is going through space. And you can kind of see it here that as that number changes the value of the electric field changes. And the reason I use the word empty space or free space is did you notice that I was getting the electric field on this surface and there was nothing between the charge in here. There was empty or free space. That's going to change real soon. And so instead of have the permittivity of free space we will have the permittivity of silicon, germanium, and all these wonderful semiconductors and insulating material as we look at what is the electric field inside our, our microprocessor? What is it inside our capacitor? What is it inside our insulating material? And so we'll be interested in how that electric field is permeating that material. Right now, I'm just trying to teach you how does the electric field permeate just empty space. If this was just a single charge out in outer space, no atoms, no molecules, no silicon, no germanium, no plastics, no rubbers, nothing else. That's what that number is related to. Did I see a question? Yeah. Oh, I guess uh, E naught is the permittivity of free space. And so we write it in the equation. And it shows up in the denominator. Uh, for reasons I don't think are real obvious until we get to putting materials in there. Uh, you can kind of see it. If this number gets bigger, which it will when we start, say we fill this space up with silicon. When we fill this up with silicon and we say, what, what's happening to an electron when it's in our processor? Okay, um, and we want how is that electric field? What we're going to see is the silicon makes that number a little bigger, and when it makes that number a little bigger, then we would say the electric field on the surface is a little bit lower. And so the silicon itself is kind of holding back the electric field; it's blocking the electric field, and so that's what that number kind of gives us. And no, it turns out that no, no, no. Uh, Any time we put material, it's going to actually hold back the electric field, not increase the electric field. Uh, unless we do oh, very rare cases. How's that?
there, there, are, there are some very weird things that, that, that you could do. And those are the kind of things that make you know, new technology. Yeah, so I say weird, but I'd say they're not interesting and they're not important. Okay. Now, let's do its number. You guys probably know the number, right? This was Coulomb's constant, 9 times 10 to the, to the ninth, right? This is 4 pi. You could put that in your calculator. And when you do all that, you will come up with 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12. Uh, and if we look at the units, the units, of course, would be the reciprocal of Coulomb's constant. Uh, so Coulomb's constant was Newton meters squared, so this per Coulomb squared. So there would be the, the units, okay? And so probably from this step forward for the rest of the semester, we will probably never use Coulomb's law again. It was a good first step. Glad we were introduced to it. Glad Coulomb discovered it. But Coulomb didn't really understand the meaning behind it. He didn't really realize, and that's what I'm trying to say here, is just like in our mechanics, we learned that when you drop something, it has an acceleration of 9.8. And that's wonderful news. That's great. But why does it have 9.8? And then we got to Newton's universal law of gravitation and learned that, well, it had 9.8 because of the mass of the Earth and the radius of the Earth and the gravitational constant. Yay! So we learned a little bit more. And so that's where we are here in our electronics. We, we have learned uh, that, okay, there is an electric field that's proportional, but where does that, why is that important? Well, that really comes from, really, the 4 pi, the, 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 the fact that the surface area of the sphere increases by this factor of 4 pi, and that this, then, is something about nature, and this is more interesting than to us. And so we're going to write everything probably from here on out with, with the epsilon in there, the permittivity of, of free space. So our equations that once looked like this for the electric field from a point charge now become this and like I said are much more interesting to write this way because they get much more down to the fundamentals. We see the 4 pi because it's radiating out in a sphere and we see the epsilon in there because we see how that electric field is permeated, in this case, free space, and we would change that to silicon or germanium or, like I said, rubbers, plastic, latexes, whatever we, we, we put in there. Okay? All right, so I put a box around here. In fact, I'm going to go one step further. I'll put a second box. <laughs> I will put a third box here, and I will tell you my terrible joke. Do you want to know all the answers to all the homework problems? Okay, I just gave it to you. There it is. There it is. You start there, fill in the details, you're done with the chapter. Maybe 30 hours from now, you'll be done with the chapter. You know, but, but that's what's going to happen as you fill in the, the, the details here. This is that whole idea that I have joked with you guys for probably too much now. I probably should stop doing it here. But what's on the top of your syllabus, on the top of all your tests? Physics is about knowing how to apply a few powerful fundamental concepts to explain a universal phenomenon. Okay? And this, that's what this whole chapter is. This whole chapter is introduce you to what Gauss discovered. And now let's use it to find the strength of electric fields. Different ones. Alright? And then so, for the balance of today and even into Tuesday, let me do that for you and with you. And so I will do them first now. You will struggle on them this weekend and hopefully get them all done. If not, I will show you more on Tuesday. I know you will talk to Don on Friday. You will probably beg for him to stay later on Friday and you know, stay late. And, but how do you do these? Well, let's do what I might call a simpler one. I believe it's figure 12. I got to get this thing changed so I can tell. Ah which one is which, but let's do this. Let's do a problem that we didn't do in the last chapter that would actually be kind of a long problem if we did Coulomb's Law, but it's going to become really simple with Gauss's Law. Let's find the electric field from a really long charge, a line of of charge. And that's what this is trying to say. So here's the picture, okay? Let me set it up for you. Make sure you see the picture. This is a long line of charge. But to keep it simple, I'm going to say it's infinitely long, all right? 
And remember we said infinitely long, that's about two centimeters in some of, in some of our materials here. So I've got this line of charge. Maybe it's a, a, oh if it's in a microprocess, maybe this is the positive voltage that is charging that chip. This is a, a, a wire inside, what we call a bus, and it goes all the way down there and everything can, all the transistors can get power off that. But it's nice and long, it's two centimeters long, it's got, it's got a bunch of charges on there. And in this case we'll make it this positive charge. But here's my question. This line of positive charge then coming from it is going to be an electric field. And as that ra electric field radiates outward, it's going to reach out and touch and affect the thousands and thousands of transistors that are nearby it, right? And I need to know how it is affected. Because I got to build this process and I want to make it faster and faster. And if that electric field is slowing it down in some way, that's going to put a limit on, on the design. And, and if the limit is too small, that's probably a poor design. And maybe I can switch my design. And I can go faster and faster and faster. And that's what technology has done over the years, right? We've, we as scientists and engineers have discovered how does it affect it in a different way? And, and, and how can we lay it out a little bit better and a little bit better and a little bit better? So there's my question. What is the electric field? What is the equation from electric field from this line of charge? So I'm going to start here with Gauss's law. So there's step one, Gauss's law here. So as I said, you want the answer to every homework problem. There it is, Gauss's law. And so how am I going to calculate the electric field? Well, of course, Gauss's law says put a surface around it. It has to be a closed surface and do the integral. And what did I say earlier about doing these integrals? The best way to do those integrals is make sure you pick out some symmetry here, right? So let's start there. This picture maybe unfortunately already shows you the Gaussian surface. So it kind of gives it away here. But if I just had a line of charge, which I always like to use this pole for the line of charge. Here's this big line of charge right here. Even before I even start this problem, could you tell me something about the electric field? Well, let's say it's positive. Could you tell me anything about the electric field? What is it? It's, it's outward, right? right? Now, let's think about this for a moment. Let's say I'm standing one meter away from it here and kind of compare to one meter here. Is there anything I can say about the electric field? Even though I've never done this problem before, even though I don't even know the equation for the electric field, could you give me some kind of intuition from this last chapter we did about the electric field here versus here? Uh, would you say it has the same strength? I would. Why would you? Right. Keep this in mind. That if you imagine yourself standing one meter away and you look at the charges, what I'll call the charge distribution, isn't it this charges that make the electric field where I'm standing? And so let's look at it. I look at it, it's one meter away, it goes way up there, and it goes way down there. I stand here. What do I see? Don't I see the same charge distribution? So I would claim here that as I stand here looking at a charge distribution, and as I stand here looking at, at the similar charge distribution, that is my clue that the electric field would have the same strength if I'm the same distance away. Fair enough? Now remember when we did this first problem, we're about to do our second one, remember what's nice about calculating it is what if you could say the electric field is the same value everywhere on the surface? How would that be helpful? Can't you pull it out of the integral? Yeah, and that is what I'm about to do. I am going to say that if you took a mathematical surface that wrapped around so that over here you're a distance r and over here you're a distance r. Even though I do not know the value of the electric field, I could at least tell you that whatever value it is, it's the same everywhere on that surface. Did you catch that? And I'll do you one better. What about direction? First of all, would the electric field point inward? Well, not if it's positive, it would be pointing outward, right? Now, could it point not straight outward, but off at an angle? Sort of like this cross-sectional area here. Your author has the electric field pointing outward. But why? Why would he even say that? 
if this is my line of charge right there and it's going out of the board and into the board and I go a distance R away from it right here you just told me that the electric field should have the same strength here as here but what about its direction I'm gonna put a dotted line would it be possible for the electric field to maybe head off at some angle other than radially outward and I'm gonna say no but why what would be your argument here well let's see so I'm standing here let's just say that right here instead of the electric field going straight out it was over there kinda like that picture shows okay fair enough now imagine this if you will let me take this big line of charge and just turn it over all right so imagine this whole thing flipping over the charges down here would go up to there the charges up there would go down to there the electric field that was pointing over here would do a point over there right so in this picture the electric field would be pointing over here and I claim that's impossible why because when you flip this over don't the charges look the same as before you flipped it so shouldn't you get the same direction to the electric field as before and is that what I have when I flip it over no how could I flip this over and get the direction of the direction of the electric field to be the same there's only one way how's that yeah and that's my argument from symmetry that electric field would have to be radially outward okay let me say it again because I know this is sometimes hard to digest but this is the kind of picture you have to do this is why we're not going to actually do the integrals we're going to solve them by looking at the picture and to look at the picture we have to know what direction is the electric field and I claim that even if you've never done this you can get it. it's as simple as this I stand here okay I imagine the direction of the electric field maybe it's here maybe it's here but if I were to flip that over and the electric field was like this and as I flipped over the electric field would be in a slightly different direction and yet I have the same charge distribution that I had before I flipped it there is no way I can get an electric field in a different direction when I have the same charge distribution fair enough so the only way I can get it is if it was radial outward because when I flip that over it's still radially outward and that's my symmetry argument yes Um uh, sure. Um, um you're asking a couple of uh questions that uh let's see how do I answer that? Uh some uh, that I can't answer, some that I think are known but I couldn't answer, and some I don't think anybody knows yet because you're asking the coupling between the gravitational fields and the electric fields, and that's the ongoing, you know, holy grail of, of science. How are those coupled? But 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 yes. So space space could be warped. But I would argue uh, that, well, for for this class, I say we're we're, we're not even going to worry about the effects of gravity here. That that's that's not the point here. So there is no gravitational field. There is no warping of gravitational space. Um, we will do a little bit of our gravitational field in physics 123, but very little. And the rest of that will have to wait really more towards graduate school. So we'll do with that. All right. So forget the black hole. No black holes. Just, just that's it. A line of charge, nothing else in the universe could you get the electric field that's what I'm after here all right so I'll say it again this why it is so absolutely critical you pick a really good Gaussian surface and my definition of good Gaussian surface is one where you can look at the charge distribution and tell something about the electric field even though the point of the problem is to find the electric field and that sounds kind of weird doesn't it okay 
But that's how we're going to do it. And I claim, before I even done any math, that I know something about that electric field. And that's why your author has drawn in here, and you see it in the picture, your author is saying that by looking at the symmetries involved, this electric field would be radially outward from the line of charge it would not at this point go to the left or to the right, as I had just argued, by flipping it over. The same thing can be argued that this electric field would not be pointing out of the plane or into the plane. Again, same argument here. Let's say that I am standing right here and the electric field is pointing up a little bit. Well again, what happens if I turn that over? Doesn't that electric field go down? Don't I get a different direction to the electric field? How could I get a different direction to the electric field when I have the same charge distribution? Do I have the same charge distribution when I flip it over? Well, if I'm right in the middle, I do. And then I would say if it's really long, I'm always in the middle. If it's infinitely long, can't you flip it and you always have an infinite above you and an infinite below you? So part of our argument right there is very important that we are only talking about something that is really, really long in charge. Would this work if it was a small wire? No, because my argument of symmetry falls apart right there. So remember I said when we started this, this is a very useful tool, but it's only useful when you have a lot of symmetry involved. And in this case, the symmetry is the fact that it's infinitely long. Okay? So if I didn't have it infinitely long, I better go back to Coulomb's law and calculate it. I think one of your homework ones had you calculating the electric field along the perpendicular bisector, right? Of a line of charge. It's a little harder math, but you could have gotten off of the perpendicular bisector and done it. And that's the way you would have to do it. You could not use Gauss's law here. For, does that make sense? I need to know the direction of the electric field. I need to have overwhelming proof here that that electric field right here is pointing radially outward. It's not to the left or to the right, and it's not up, and it's not down. And I can only do that from the symmetry argument, the visual picture, okay? And once I've done that, then this is going to be amazingly easy, okay? But I got to do that. I got to say something about the strength of the field on the Gaussian surface, and I got to say something about the direction. And with a lot of symmetry, that's pretty easy to do. So now I'm going to finish the problem. Hard problem, we've already done here. Because I will do the first step, which is a dot product. E, D, A, cosine of theta equals Q epsilon naught. Okay? Now, to actually then do this integral, I've got to go over a closed surface. And if you look at that blue surface, it looks like a cylinder. And a cylinder has a top and a bottom to it. And then it has the part that wraps around, the part that I focused mostly on so far. But hopefully you haven't forgotten there is a top. Okay? Let's look at the top. Up at the top, as I go to do my calculations, I won't even include everything. I'm just going to put the angle. What is the angle there at the top? Is it at 90 degrees? That's why it was so important that we reasoned out that this is infinitely long. Now notice I'm saying the charge is infinitely long, not the Gaussian surface. The Gaussian surface does have a top. It's got to be closed. And so I do have a top to it. I have a top and I would say that at the top of the cylinder, if I take a, you know, wrap and here's the top of the cylinder, DA is up. Which way is the electric field? Radially outward. And everywhere on that top surface then, I got cosine of 90 degrees. And what is cosine of 90 degrees? Zero. So how much flux goes through that top surface? None, right? Isn't it the same argument for the bottom surface? And so along the bottom surface, again, I will put cosine of 90 degrees. Okay? So there's no flux at the top or at the bottom. Okay? So, the whole problem is really about that face, the part that, that wraps around, yeah. Um, I thought you had to ignore charges outside of the surface. I do. Um, so, wouldn't that result in the lines kind of Oh, wait, 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 wait. Okay, don't miss this. Okay, fair enough. 
the electric field truly is created by all the surfaces, right? So as I stood over here and asked you to give me some detail about the electric field, I included all the charges. Charges that were outside the surface because, again, the total electric field really is created by all the surfaces. Now, what Gauss discovered here is that even though the total electric field is created by all of them, when you put this into this equation, you're only going to need in the equation part to worry about the parts that are inside your closed surface. So I haven't got to that part yet. And I, I think that's your dilemma here. When I looked about the whole electric field, I did look at all the charges. But now, in a minute, when I go to char calculate this right-hand side, I am only going to worry about the charges that are inside the surface. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what makes the calculations nice to do because I don't have to worry about the inside. But the reality is the electric field total does come from everything and I don't want to forget that. It's just because the flux going in and equals the stuff going out of the Gaussian surface is that it doesn't show up in the equation. But it really does have flux. So I got to think about that. Good. Okay, so now on to the most significant part of this which is the face. Let's do the face. And as I do the dot product, E times dA times cosine of, I can answer that question. Along the face, what is the angle between the electric field and the dA? It's zero, right? That was our, our symmetry argument. That's what the author is trying to show here. Here's electric field out. Here is the dA. So here we get cosine of zero degrees everywhere. So not only is it a constant that I can pull it out, but it is the number one. And in fact, there was another argument I made here. What could I say about the electric field on the face? It was a constant, and that's really the big key right there. I pull it out of the integral. See, if I don't pull it out of the integral, now there's really nothing I can do, right? Because I don't know the equation for that electric field. That's the point of the problem. Find the equation for the electric field. And if it's inside the integral, I have to know its function to integrate it. And that's why I said we have to do a little bit of reasoning about the electric field. And in this case, I reasoned that it was a constant over the correct surface. So notice the surface I've drawn. Did I draw a sphere? No, it wouldn't work well for a sphere. Did I draw a cube? No, it wouldn't work well for a cube. But a cylinder would. And that was the key to this the symmetry. So, with that in mind, and uh, as you pointed out, this should have inside, this should have inside, all written by it, inside over epsilon naught. And so now, this becomes E, and then this right here, integral, is very easy to do. What's the integral of that? <laughs> the area. Area of what? area of that face. So how do I get the area of that face? Yeah, I don't do the integral. I go back to geometry. It's what? It's, right, it's the circumference. 2 pi r times the length or height of the cylinder. So there's the area of that face. And that has to equal the charge that is inside over epsilon naught. All right? So again, just to kind of summarize here, this is the part I really wanted you to see. I wanted you to see how you're going to do this side of the equation. The other side of the equation I think is relatively straightforward. It is, you've got to find the charge. And as you pointed out, it's not all the charge. I'm not worried about how long this thing is. It does have to be long enough for me to do my symmetry arguments that I did back here, okay? So it doesn't work for a finite size. But how am I going to get the charge inside? Well, let me just take the charge density times its length. Right? And so, I know I just threw this up here, but in this problem they're saying, look, this is a long charge with a charge density of lambda. So, take that charge density times its length. That's how much charge is inside. Would you have to worry about how much space the rod is taking from the surface You mean the, the, the thickness of the rod? Uh, no, no. I mean, this, 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 the, as long as I, my Gaussian surface is outside of my cylinder, okay, which 
the, the next question is let's get inside my cylinder, okay, but outside of that cylinder, everything I've just said would still be true no matter how big this is, as long as the charge is evenly distributed there, because remember my symmetry about flipping it over and moving across, everywhere I learn on that surface, it's, the charge distribution has to look the same, okay, which I'm glad you asked because that's my next step here, okay, and that's what I, like I said, I want you to, to see here. Well, we're just about done, okay. Uh, you can see that there's an L on each side, so it cancels off. In fact, that shouldn't surprise you, because where did the L come from anyways? Doesn't the L come from the Gaussian surface, how big we made the surface? I mean, how long we, we drew the surface? And I claim the electric field should have nothing to do with this mathematical surface. I claim the electric field comes from this line of charge and how far away I am. So when this is all said and done, I hope that I get an equation for the electric field that doesn't have an L in it. That, that would just bother me to no end. So there's no reason there should be an L in it. Uh, should there be a distance R? Yes. Should there be a lambda for how much charge there is? Yes. That's what determines the electric field, but not this L. So the fact that it crosses off is a really good sign. I, I would really be bothered by it if I did. And now, like I said, I'm done. Here it is. The electric field is what? Well, it's 1 over 2 pi epsilon naught lambda over r. And so now we've got the equation for the electric field from a line of charge. Uh, we did it last chapter for a point. Uh, we did it last chapter for an infinite line. You did it on the homework perpendicular to a finite line. I mean, we did a bunch of good examples last chapter. And we learned one technique. Uh, but this is an infinite line, and we are radially outward. Okay? Um, I, obviously, mathematically, they could be either way. But I always like to write my equations. Constants first and then the things that I can change as I am building or experimenting with it. I can change how much charge, I can change how much distance. So these are the variables in the equation. These are the constants. So, so I just wrote them in that order. Okay. And by the way, it does agree with the same number that your author did using Coulomb's law. If you go back to 23, he actually found the electric field from a line. And he got that after a lot of calculus. Okay. Q? Well, the, that was this step right here. Yeah. Yeah. And since it's infinitely long, I can't really have a Q in the answer because infinitely long would mean infinitely amount of charge. So I have to write this in terms of charge per length. Okay. Now I think that's the next level up. Let's try this. Here's one that we mentioned in the lab yesterday or you guys will see today. I think it's uh, number 10 here, and it says this. Let's put a charge in a spherical distribution, but it's not a point. What would the electric field from this look like? Okay. And so, you guys, like I uh, already said, is last chapter, you learned b the electric field from a point. The truth is you're never going to be able to put the charge in a point. It's always got to have some kind of size to it. And that's what this problem is. And this problem is going to be so much easier with Gauss's law compared to Coulomb's law. It's why we didn't do it last chapter. We said, okay, let's, let's find it. So let me take a ball. I mean, if you can imagine, this is the ball. I take this ball and I put a charge on it. And I come over here and I say, well, what's the electric field here? From a ball of charge. All right. So, let's give it a try. So I'll take a ball and I'll put some charge. In fact, there's two ways I can put this charge on the ball. I could put it so that the charge is either spread uniformly throughout the ball, and so that's kind of what I'm illustrating here, or I could just stack the, the charge all on the, on the surface. But either way, to keep our problem as simple as we can, let's just make sure it's evenly distributed, whether it's evenly distributed throughout the volume or whether it's evenly distributed on the surface.
Okay? Now, your author, in this example, is trying to say, let's put it throughout the surface. Okay? So maybe I would be better off to just focus on that one. So I will focus on this one, and I will apply Gauss's law. So here's the equation. Integral E dot dA equals charge that is inside over epsilon naught. Okay? And so maybe I'll just give a little labeling here. Let's say that the total charge we put on this ball is capital Q. Okay? So we capital Q, spread it out uniformly. Uh, let's also say, for the sake of discussion, that the radius of this ball, do they give a radius? A, don't they? Yeah, A. And so we'll say the radius of the ball is A. But again, as another example, could we do this? Well, let's start there. We need a surface. Okay? So let's draw a surface. Now again, unfortunately my diagram probably gives it away. You've got to learn this technique of deciding what surface you're going to think about. But what is the chances, what surface you're going to pick? Chances are it's spherical. Why would you pick spherical? Yeah, the charge is spherical, right? And so again, if we take a ball, let's say this is the ball, which I know, for, don't look at the back side, but if here's the ball, right? If I were to stand a distance r from the ball, there would be some electric field here, right? Compare that to me standing over here, a distance r. How do you think that electric field would compare? I would say it's the same strength, right? And the reason I would say that is because as I look at the charge here, it has a certain distribution that gives me a total field. I'm looking at the same distribution and therefore give me the same field. And so by picking a surface, which they don't really show it in three dimensions here. They've just done a dotted line as a cross section. But as wrapping a spherical surface around it, what I can say, even though I don't know the equation for the electric field, is I can say the electric field on that surface is a constant value. And as you just saw in the last one, and you'll see this one, what's nice about having the electric field a constant, what could I do with it? Pull it in front of the integral. Because if I can't pull it in front of the integral, and I don't know it's an equation, I really can't do anything. That's why the symmetry argument needs to be made first. If you don't have that, you can't use Gauss's law. Go back to Coulomb's law. Or use what we will learn next chapter. Okay? But don't use Gauss's law. Gauss's law requires that argument of symmetry here. Okay? And so that is an, the, the most important step. Even though I'm not going to write anything on the board, it's the stuff that goes on in your head here at the beginning. Electric field at this point has the same value. Let's talk about direction of the electric field too. Right? like I did with that infinite line. Couldn't I say something about the direction of the electric field? Again, think about this electric field. If that electric field at this point was not radially outward, but it was radial outward and up, then imagine taking that and turning it over. Turn it, the whole room over. So that charge would turn over and what this field would turn over. So now this field's pointing down. But as you look back at this, because it's spherical, doesn't it have the same charge distribution? So how could the same charge distribution end up with an electric field that's now pointing down when before it was up? Couldn't happen, right? And that's the argument that there is no way the electric field created from a spherical charge distribution could have a piece pointing up. Because again, when you look at it upside down, the field would be pointing down. And yet you would have the same charge distribution. There's no way that same charge distribution one time would make it up and one time make it down. It doesn't work that way. It's got to be the same. And the only way it's going to be the same is if it was straight radially outward, right? Because when you turn that over, you have the same charge distribution and you also have the same direction. And so that's our argument, both the strength and the direction. So, even though I don't know the equation for the electric field from a ball, I do know that it is going to be radially outward and it's going to have the same value when I'm a distance far away. That's why a Gaussian surface that is sp spherical it becomes a powerful tool. And so I will actually do then this integral by saying E dA cosine of zero. You see that?
Fair enough? Because if I'm on this surface somewhere, isn't the dA radially outward? And then it we just say the electric field would be radially outward. Whether it be here or whether it be here or whether it be here. Okay? The direction of the electric field and the direction of the dA are in the same direction. Whether that be up or down or right or left. And so the angle is zero everywhere across there. And that's nice because you know about cosine of zero is one. Also, you know that the electric field is a constant. And so I pull it out. And like I said, that is the important step. Because I don't know the equation for the electric field. So if it's buried inside the integral, I'm stuck. Okay? Or at least I should say, at this point in my education, <laughs> I am stuck. <laughs> You are in the process of learning things like divergence and curls and gradients and things that will save us. And that's what your electric and magnetic teacher will do next year when you are UCSB and on to bigger and better places and discovering great things and making millions of dollars and remembering where you got your start and giving charity donations so we can fix the ceilings and remembering your early teacher likes his Ferraris red. <laughs> okay? <laughs> All right. So, for us, we're going to do this. We're going to pull it out and leave it outside. Okay? And until we get a little more math, we're going we're to kind of be stuck with that. And that's going to be our argument here. Okay? Now, again, once we do that, notice how simple the integral is. We don't really do the integral. Because the integral of dA is what? <laughs> A, area of what? The sphere. And the area of the sphere is what? 4 pi a squared. Okay. Oh. 4 pi r squared. Uh-oh. Area of what? The earth? Well, that's not the earth. I can rule that one out. Yeah. It's a Gaussian surface, isn't it? And as simple as that seems, I see a lot of students on test who put 4 pi a squared. That's the area of what? <laughs> That's the ball. <laughs> That's where the charge is. I'm not, I'm not saying the area of the ball. What am I doing? I am integrating over the surface, the Gaussian surface. All right, so do not put <laughs> a squared. Okay? Look closely at what you are doing. You are integrating the electric field on the surface, on the Gaussian surface, on that blue surface. So it is the area of that surface. Okay? Not the area of the ball. Okay. That was pretty easy, I think. A couple lines, right? Started with the equation. There's the answer to all the homework problems. Shoot, it's the answer to half the test. Right there, there. Okay. What about the other side of the equation? How much charge is inside my Gaussian surface? <laughs> all of it. I, I put it all in, right? So <laughs> that's going to be easy. That's capital Q. Yay. That's one. Right. And so what I get is electric field equals 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught capital Q over R squared. So there we have something we hadn't done before. We find the electric field when you're outside of this ball of uniform distribution. By the way, doesn't it look familiar? What was the electric field from a point charge in the last chapter? Wasn't it the same thing? All right, so hopefully the lesson you take with this is it really doesn't matter if you have a point charge or a ball that is uniformly distributed. The equation, the electric field outside is the same. Now inside is very different. Of course, a point we couldn't get in the inside, so we didn't even have this discussion last time. But now we're going to get inside that ball and ask what's the electric field on the inside. That's a little harder problem. But on the outside, the electric field on the outside is exactly what was the same for a point charge. Th that's why those of you who did the lab, which I guess is two-thirds of you who've already done the lab, is do you, when we did the lab and we measured the electric field, did we just take a ball and put charge on it? 
And the fact that the ball was pretty big, I just said, look, don't worry about the ball's big. It's the same as if it was a point. And this is the proof. Okay? And that's what we, the rest of you will do this afternoon. We'll put this ball there, we'll put charge on it, and I'll say, look, measure the electric field. And the electric field should have this behavior. That's the whole point of the lab, to measure that the electric field gets weaker with this inversely squared of the, of the distance. Okay? And so there's the electric field. Now, I, I should make a note about this. What would have changed in the problem, if any, had the charge been wrapped along the outer surface instead of uniformly spread out inside? Well, let me ask you, step by step. Would you, this one, I drew a spherical Gaussian surface. Would you do that here? Yeah, I still would. And if I stood on the surface right here and compared it to here, wouldn't I, if I look back, see the same charge distribution as I look back there? So wouldn't my first argument still be the same, that whatever the electric field is here, it is here? And what about direction? I would still argue that the electric field would have to be radially outward, because again, if it's not, if it was off at an angle like this and I turn the ball around, then this electric field would go over to here, but yet I would have the same charge distribution. So the fact that I turn it around, just like I turn it around here, I get the same charge distribution, tells me that the field's got to be radially outward. So my arguments are still the same. That hasn't changed. Anything else here? Let's see. The angle would still be zero, okay. Electric field would still be constant on the surface. I'd pull it out. Area would be still the area of the Gaussian surface, 4 pi r squared. The charge would still be the charge inside. Just in this case, it's all on the surface instead of spread out uniformly, but it's still be. So don't I end up with the same thing? Okay, so the lesson to take away is, I don't care if this is a point, I don't care if this is a ball that is charged spread out on the inside, or a ball where the charge is just on the outside. This is the equation for the electric field. So balls and spheres are pretty nice. They give you the same value of the electric field on the, on the outside here. As long as they are spread uniformly. Remember that? Spread uniformly. That was our argument here. They got to be spread uniformly for this flip to be true and for that angle to be zero and to justify pulling the electric field out in front. Okay? But now let's go to the inside. What is the electric field on the inside? And like I said, for a point charge that you can't even ask that question on the inside. I lost the cap to this. I didn't want it to dry out. Uh, but I guess it's gonna. <laughs> I don't know what I, I did with the cap here. Uh, but if we look on the inside, oh, which is figure B here, okay, let's do a Gaussian surface there. And so we could take and have the charge again spread out uniformly, or we could have the scenario where the charge is spread out only on the surface. Now, before we do too much of this, maybe we should come back here and say, well, how come this does work out like a point charge? Because if I was right here, I would think that these charges right here are a little bit closer than the center. But what else is true? Aren't these charges over here further away? And so this is to my left, and this is to my right. And so the reason it comes out to be the same equation as if all the charges was at a point in the center here is because of this fact. This is a little closer, and this is a little further. Okay? And we're going to see the same thing here when we look at the electric field on the inside. Let me draw a Gaussian surface. And in this case, I will change colors. Oh, I probably should have matched. Uh, okay, if I don't match exactly here. Huh? Do a Gaussian surface. So my Gaussian surface is going to be in green. Theirs is in blue. But again, the hard part or the challenging part is we need to make a good surface. I'm not drawing a cube. <laughs> I'm drawing a sphere. 
And if for no other reason, just because the charges are a sphere. But the most important part of this is you recognize something about the electric field on that surface. Because I want to find that electric field. That's my ultimate goal. What is the value of the electric field? But to get there, I got to get it out of the integral. And to get it out of the integral, I got to justify why I can get it out of the integral. There's something about it. So far, they've always been constants, and that's been the easiest justification. It won't always be that easy, but that's been my justification so far. And it's going to be again here. When I stand right here on that Gaussian surface, maybe I'll put it in red, I stand right here compared to right here. And I look at the charges that are around me. So again, if you could imagine, maybe this now is the center of the ball. But the charges are all the way out. And you're one meter from the center. And the charges go beyond you. And as you look around, you see towards the center of the ball. You see towards outside the ball. You see up and below. Isn't the charge all around you? But compare that to standing over here. What do you see? Isn't it exactly the same charge distribution? Granted, more complicated than any of the ones we've done so far, but I still see the center of the ball, a meter in front of me. I see charges above and below. I see charges going out to the edge of the ball. So whatever I see here, I see here. And that's an important argument, that what I know is the electric field everywhere along a surface that's in the shape of a sphere is the same. And as we saw many times, the reason we will care about that is right here in this step. We're going to pull it out of the integral so we can find the equation for it. So we don't have to know the whole equation of the electric field inside. If we did, we were done. That's what we're trying to get. But we have to know enough. We have to know enough to justify why it is a constant. I'll also go with direction. Now that we've done this a number of times, can't you see the same effect here? If I stand right here and I'm a meter away from the center there, and I look at the direction of the electric field, Oh, let's say I think it's up. And I flip this ball over. And I flip it right along a line that's down the center. Doesn't I, don't I end up with the same charge distribution? The stuff at the bottom now gets to the top and the stuff at the top gets to the bottom. So it's the same charge distribution and yet as I flip it over that electric field would be pointing down. That would be impossible to have a same charge distribution and one time it was pointing up and one time it's pointing down. That can't happen. And so what direction could it be? It could only be what? Yeah, radially outward or radially inward. And I could probably argue if it were negative charges they'd be radially inward and if they were positive charges they would be radially outward. But they would have to be radially. That's why the surface I draw around it is a sphere. Because as I draw a sphere, this first step right here, when I go, all right, let's do the integral. E dA cosine of zero degrees. So the right Gaussian surface has so far made that come out to be something I know, zero degrees. It could have been 180, it, it, it could have been um, 90, uh, depending on my surface. We've obviously have done the ones that are supposed to be the beginning ones, the easy ones, the ones that make sense to teach students the first time. For most of you, this is your first calculus-based electricity class, right? And so this is my argument that everywhere along that Gaussian surface, it is zero, okay? And my argument is that everywhere along that Gaussian surface, the electric field is a constant, okay? And so you've seen me do that a number of times. So maybe I won't spend as much time on that as, as, I, as I was, but that's this, this idea. And so when I actually do this integral, I get E times 4 pi times, is it R squared or A squared? Huh? Still R squared, just now R happens to be smaller than A, right? But what I'm integrating is I'm integrating the electric field on that Gaussian surface, on that blue surface. And that blue surface and that picture B over there has a radius of A. The ball has a radius of, I mean, the Gaussian has a, a radius of R, the ball has a radius of A, right? And so that's the left side of the equation. 
And of course, you can see that that really hasn't even changed from anything we did over here. So that's a lot to say, although the other side of the equation will change. What, what happens over here? This is a very important step there. Charge on the inside. You see, last time when we did it on the outside of the ball, what did I say was the charge of the inside of the Gaussian surface? It was a whole charge, right? Do I have the whole charge inside the Gaussian surface? No. So how much charge do I have inside the Gaussian surface? Okay, yeah, it's a fraction. Okay, so how much? Yeah, it's, it's, it's probably worth working out. Uh, fortunately, the charge, as I said, was evenly spread out. So because it's evenly spread out, I could just do ratios. So maybe I'll do that first. But just in case it's not evenly spread out, I probably should add it together and use my calculus. Either way, in this case, I should come out with the same one, but, you know. So I would say the charge inside is compared to the total charge as the volume on the inside. What's the volume? <coughs> of the whole thing. Fair enough? And so again, if it's evenly distribution, that's great. It won't always be evenly <laughs> distributed. But if it does, that I can just do a proportion, right? How does the charge inside compare to the whole compared to the volume on the inside to the whole? And so what this reduces down to is the four-thirds cancel off, the pi's cancel off, and the charge on the inside then becomes an R cubed over an A cubed times the total charge, right? Now, I better not spend too much time on it because uh, maybe I'll end up doing this on, t on Tuesday, but let's just say it was not <laughs> uniformly distributed, okay? How would you get it? Well, it kind of depends on how it is not uniformly distributed. But at least let's say this. Let's say you thought of it as a bunch of rings. And so the charge may have changed, but it changed radially. And what I mean by that is if you go a certain distance out, that you get the same charge density. So one ring has the same charge as another ring, as another ring, and another ring. And maybe I shouldn't call them ring. I guess they're shells. A shell plus a shell plus a shell. So I could do this. I could say something like this, that the, the total charge inside would be a summation or an integral, right, of the charge that is on one shell. How would I get the charge, say this is a shell here, And then kind of wrap around so it's got a thickness of dr. Wouldn't I say charge density times the volume of a shell? Wouldn't that be the charge in one shell? Remember we used rho for charge density? And so help me out here. How do I get the volume of a shell? Wouldn't it be the surface area of the shell times its thickness? So wouldn't this be 4 pi r squared dr? Right? And I know that's a hard one to do. <laughs> but that's why we just did that last chapter and kept doing it, right? That's what the calculus is saying, right? Charge density times volume. Volume of a shell. Add it up from zero to R. And that is going to be our charge inside. Now in the simple case, 
where the charge density is a constant, couldn't you just pull the charge density out? And so let me do the simple case and see if I get the same thing. In the simple case, I should be able to pull the charge density out and do the integral. And when I do the integral, I get R cubed over 3. And the charge density would be the total charge spread out inside of the whole ball. And so the 4 pi's cancel off, the 3's cancel off, and you get total charge R cubed over A cubed. So is that the same thing I got when I did my ratios? Yay! Okay, so easy case. Real case. Okay, so this is a nice uniform charge distribution. Do a proportion. Don't rely on this too much. This is what you want to do. Charge density times volume, add up, get the total charge inside. Question? Oh, I, I, I apologize. Yes, I, I kind of got two things going on, um, and I started drawing on this one. I'm sorry. I'm, 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 real, I'm still talking about this one. Yeah, yeah, sorry. This, this is the surface I should have been drawing, because uh, that one does have a charge inside. In fact, you just answered the next one I'm about to do. What is the charge inside the wall? So you can see this one's going to be a lot easier. But oh, good. I'll hold off on that one. All right. So anyways, like I said, the, now we've changed. And I think calculating this side of the equation is a little bit harder. We've got to find out how much charge is inside. Okay? And so you can either do it by proportions or you can do it with calculus. I, I prefer you do the calculus because the calculus does it for any case. Obviously, for the special case where the charge density is a constant, you can pull it out and get this one. This one's nice to get to because... You don't need any calculus when they're uniformly distributed. It's just proportions. But the reality is they all come from a calculus. It's summing up a shell plus a shell plus a shell plus a shell plus a shell. Okay? Well, I hopefully I have it here. And so I will put the 1 over epsilon here. And the charge inside now becomes Q R cubed over A cubed. And as I finally finish my algebra and rewrite this and do, I think the, the hardest one we've done so far here today is what is the electric field on the inside is then becomes 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. So that's this guy here. Then I've got a charge, Q. You'll see that two of the R's cancel with two of the three on the other side. So there's still an R over here. And then there's an A cubed, right? And so there is by far a new equation. And one would have been extremely difficult to do had I been doing this with Coulomb's law. Fortunately, with Gauss's law, and maybe you don't feel that quite yet. Some of you are looking a little shell-shocked here with the integrals I I just did. But one, two, three, four steps. Come on. How hard is four steps? All right. <laughs> but it can get tricky on finding out how much charge is inside. And so let's think about what we have so far now. This is what we've discovered. For this ball that has a uniform charge distribution, we've discovered this. That if this is the size of the ball A, on the inside, this is the equation. On the outside, oh, I erased it. But on the outside, it's the equation for like a point. And so this one is linear. This one comes up and gets bigger and bigger and bigger until you get a value of 1 over 4 pi epsilon Q over A squared. That's the field at the surface. Whether you use this equation or you use the outside equation, they match, of course, at the surface. Then once you get on the outside, they taper off. Okay? And so, inside equation, outside equation. 
And that was really a good example of the power of Gauss's law. I can find the electric field on the inside of this ball. Yeah. Coulomb's constant? It is equals to Coulomb's constant. Uh, the reason is maybe more personal than really necessity. I like epsilon. Epsilon tells me something much more physical than Coulomb's constant. Coulomb's constant is just a proportionality. This epsilon here is telling me how the electric field is penetrating the space. In this case, it's free space. I have no other thing. But I'm going to fill this up with other materials, silicon, germanium, and that number is going to change. And so this little ball of charge will now be a ball of charge uh, made of silicon that's inside my processor. Okay? And so I like that number floating around. I don't like to get rid of it. Unfortunately, that means the 4 pi floats around with it. That's a little annoying, but the 4 pi is kind of nice because it does tell me a little bit about the geometry of space. Surface area is 4 pi. So I would think you mathematicians would just love that, you know. Four pies. I love four pies, right? I love irrational numbers. Okay. Throw, it, throw it in there. All right, but see the idea? I've got the electric field now on the outside. Again, I, I to told you this two hours ago if you're still hanging on to this marathon here and going, all right. The idea is now the lecture, like I said, was over a long time ago. It's Gauss's Law. There's really nothing more I can show you in this chapter. It's Gauss's Law. And now, you know, or I should say teach you. Now I can just show you. Show you example after example after example. You know, is what is that electric field? All right. Uh, shall we try then? Uh, what was 11 here? Ah, so 11 is the conclusion that we just came up with, right? This is the electric field, and hopefully we get the same thing, although as you can see, they, they obviously the author likes Coulomb's constant there. They put it in terms of Coulomb's constant, and they get the linear relationship inside the ball, and then they get the tapering off, which you get outside the ball. And hopefully you can kind of see why. I mean, the tapering off outside the ball makes sense, because you're getting further and further from the charges. Why the increase? In fact, why don't I go to the center of the ball? What is the value of the electric field at the center of the ball? It's zero. Why? Oh, okay. okay, I'll stay away from that. I mean, I, I heard what you said. In terms of Gauss's law, there's no charges. When you, know, when you get this thing smaller, there's no charges. But, but looking at all the charges, why would I say the electric field? I mean, if I had never done Gauss's law, I would still tell you the electric field in the center is zero. Why? Right, I got it. just as much charge on the left of the ball and the right of the ball, right? And so whatever electric field is created by the stuff on the left equals the stuff that's created on the right. Bunch of electric fields cancel off, and I should get zero. So I expected that. I expected to have zero electric field. And it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger because as I move out from the center of the ball, I start to get more charge on the left of me and the right versus the right of me. And as I move out here, I'm getting a lot of charge on this side, and it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And so they're not, you're not canceling. Am I getting further away? Well, I, I am a little bit in that, but the fact that I'm just gaining more charge to the left or the right tells me that that dominates it, and the electric field just gets stronger and stronger and stronger. So in this case, the strongest electric field is clearly on the surface. Tapers off beyond that, goes and tapers off on the inside there. Okay. Now, the one that I got mixed up with and started to do is, what about the inside of that other charge distribution? What about the inside for the one that the charge was all on the surface? What about this? Well, yeah, now, a good point. And for those of you who didn't hear, I haven't gotten that far. But in, the, in this chapter, uh, we are going to learn that uh, you cannot do something like this in a conductor. If you put the charge um, on a conductor, uh, what it does, and I, I'll do that next to see how much time we have left, is it tends to flow to the outside. So this, the reason I'm doing this is we're about to say this is what will happen for an insulator. And this is the charge distribution that will happen for a conductor. Okay. So let me go ahead and make a Gaussian surface. We'll do this one short and sweet. 
as I go ahead and do this uh, same argument as I do Gauss's law, the first step would be the integral of E d a cosine of theta. If my Gaussian surface is spherical, I'd say I could pull E outside. I'd get this d a. The angle would be zero degrees. Then I would get E times four pi r squared. So the Gaussian surface is exactly the same, uh, you know, with a charge spread out uniformly inside versus only on the surface. It's the other side of the equation that changes. This side of the equation is how much charge is inside your Gaussian surface. And how much is inside my Gaussian surface? Zero. It's all on the outside of the ball. So what does the value of the electric field equal? Inside the ball? Zero. So I get no electric field inside the ball. Okay? And so that's the kind of the difference here. Here I would have an electric field that gets stronger and stronger. This one would look a little different. In a graph, it would look something like this. Here's the electric field, here's the radius of the ball, and you would have nothing, 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 nothing. And then all of a sudden you would hit the charges, which creates the field, and then it tapers off. Right? And so that's what I get in a, in a ball like, like this. Okay. Is that what equal to zero? Oh, uh, this is Q inside over epsilon. And so there's my, how much charge is inside? Zero. No charge inside. And then, you know, solve the math. Well, let me do one more, and I guess we won't quite get to the whole ideas of conductors. We'll have to finish that on, on, on Tuesday here, and then I'll do some examples from the book. But your author says, what about if you're really, really close to a surface? In other words, let's not worry about the whole entire shape here. Okay? But what if you're this? What if you have... Uh, I got a, this one here. It says, look, let's, let's just take a, a sheet here, if you will. Okay? And, and who knows what this thing looks like? It could be a real complicated looking object. But at some point here, I can take part of it. Okay? And in fact, maybe I won't even, let me not close it up here. Let me just take, okay, here's a piece of plastic. Maybe I folded it around a few times. Maybe something like that. Okay. But at some point here, let's just grab a small section of it and get really, really close to it. So it looks something like this. This is what your author is trying to say. He said, look real close to the surface. So we've got this charge spread out. We're close enough. We'll, do, we'll say for the sake of argument that it's, that it's kind of uniformly spread out throughout that, uh, that, that surface. Uh, if it's not, maybe we'll talk about, you know, in the limit that we get a little bit smaller. But, but, it, but on some scale, we could get really close. And what that, would that look like? What would the electric field look like when you're close to any surface? And that's kind of nice. Well, we could apply Gauss's law to this. And your author does. Your author says, look, let's do Gauss's law. When you are very close. Okay? And so we need to pick a Gaussian surface. And this one I think might be a little bit harder to see the, 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 the choice you're going to make. But again, the choice you make is really based upon the electric field because you've got to do that integral. So let's look at the electric field. And so maybe I'll just stand over here near the door. Here's the door. So this is my sheet. And so my sheet has a bunch of charges from it. As I stand really close to the door, not, not far, because obviously you would think that the, the, the farther I get, the, the more the field changes. But I'm, but I'm going to say that I am so close that I can pretty much look at this door and say, there is a lot of charge that way and a lot of charge this way, right? And I'm so close that if I were to flip this whole thing over, 
there would still be a lot of charge that way and a lot of charge that. In other words, the charge distribution would still look roughly the same. So what would that tell me about the direction of the electric field as I stand here? What direction would have the electric field have to be? Wouldn't it have to be straight out away from the surface? If I were to stand over here, wouldn't it still have to be straight out from the surface? Because again, if I'm close enough, if this is big enough that, that I'm close, if this is one centimeter long and I am one micron close to it, I am close enough to say that there is a lot of charge that way and a lot of charge that way. And if that electric field was pointing up a little bit and you turned it over, now it's pointing down and yet I have the same charge distribution when I turn it over. So I can't have that. I can't have it pointing up. I can't have it pointing left or right. It's got to point right out from the surface. Fair enough? And in fact, I would say it doesn't even really matter how far out I come. Now, I would agree that if I go out too far, way out here, aren't I get further and further from those charges? And my field should get weaker and weaker? Okay. But if I am close enough here, I can come a, a short distance, or I can come a long distance, right? Don't I still really just have a bunch of charge? Right? Uh, maybe a little bit further out, but at least everywhere along this surface, I would say it has the same value. Fair enough? Because I'm not really not really closer to that end. I'm not really closer to this end. Fair enough? So, I need a good surface. Well, this is what your author has picked. He's picked a cylinder again. And the only part that really matters is this, this side of the surface. Um, before I called this top and bottom, now that it's laying on its side, I'm not sure if I should call it top and bottom, but if it's okay if I still call it, or maybe I'll call it left and right, okay, so you know, here's right, here's left, but the point is, this is the part that's, that, that's going to matter here. The fact that he took a cylinder, then the cross section is a circle, as you'll see, really doesn't matter. He could have made the cross section a square or a rectangle, because the argument is about flux. And so when I do this equation, I have to do the right part of it, I have to do the left part of it, and I have to do the wrapped around part, which I call the face, in order to do that integral, right? But the wrap around part, the face part, how much flux goes through it? Do you see it? Answer? Zero, right? I'll come back and stand by this door, right? Here's the, here in front of me is the right face, the, the, the right side of it. The face part, the curved part is from here back to here. And so as I get closer and further, you may argue that the strength of the field changes or maybe it doesn't change. We'll find out here in a second. That doesn't matter. Isn't it pointing outward that way? And the DA is this way? And over here as the surface curves around, DA is that way and the electric field is that way. And so everywhere along this face part of it, I get cosine of zero degrees. I'm sorry, 90 degrees. Which is zero, <laughs> is what I'm trying to say. There is no flux, as a lot of you said. There's no flux that go through this wrapped around part, the face part. Okay? How about this part here? This rounded part. What I would call the right side. Well, we argued that the electric field would have the same strength over it, right? Again, you're talking about a small cylinder. We're looking at a surface that's, you know, small enough that I'm saying I'm real close. I'm flat to it. So I'm, I'm, I'm talking about what if I'm really close to a surface, okay? And so if I'm really close to a surface, the field here, the field here, the field here. It doesn't matter where I go on the surface. It's the same thing. And I can pull it out in front of the integral. And then the area of it becomes pi r squared, where r is this radius. They don't have it labeled. In fact, he just has it labeled a. Turns out it's going to cancel off, so maybe I'll just call it a too. Okay. How about the other side? What about the left-hand side? Oh, got to finish this real quick here. This one back here, the left side. Isn't it just like the right side? Oh, but it's the other direction, so it's negative flux? Is it negative flux? No, it's positive. It's still going out from it, right? This, this goes out, and this goes out. And so you get the same value here 
as Ea. And so there's Gauss's law. That is the flux. The flux is 2Ea, where E is the value of the electric field right here on the top part, or the right-hand part of this. Okay. What about the other side of the equation? How much charge is enclosed in the Gaussian surface? Okay. Remember that sigma? What did sigma mean? Charge per area. Okay, so whatever the charge is on this sheet. Okay, so we call that sigma. And so if I go sigma times A, wouldn't that be the total charge that is inside there? And notice the A's cancel off. And what we finish with is an equation that's going to become very useful. Is what is the value of the electric field when you're very close to a surface? It, of course is related to the charge density. How much charge is there? That kind of makes sense, right? If, if I'm real close here and there's a lot of charge density here, I should get a strong field. So it doesn't surprise me that it's a charge density. I d maybe what does surprise you is I need to divide it by 2 and I need to divide it by epsilon, but that's the electric field. Also, I think what might surprise you is does it matter how far away I am from the surface? Do you see a distance from the surface? And that's going to become very useful. What this is also saying here is if I'm really close, or maybe not so really close, but still really close that this looks like a flat surface. Okay, I can't get all the way out to here. But whether I am a nanometer, or 10 nanometers, or 100 nanometers, I'm going to get about the same strength of the electric field. And it is a constant. We're going to use that. Yeah. In the book, they don't have the two. Oh, yeah, they do. They don't have the two when they did a conductor. Because now when we do a conductor, there will be no electric field on that surface. That term is now zero, and there's no two. So, there's a little difference.